Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the CIA Part 3 Q&A Tips Practice Questions webinar today. My name is Kelly Quinn, and I am the IA's Vice President of Strategic Partnerships, and I will be your host for today's broadcast. If you experience any technical issues at any point today, please press the F5 key on your PC keyboard or the refresh keys on your Mac to refresh your console, and that typically will resolve most issues. It's also recommended that you close out any other programs on your computer, such as your email, to ensure that you have the maximum bandwidth to view the program. If you continue to experience any challenges, please just send us a message using the help widget on your console for technical assistance, and we will work with you in the background. So now I would like to introduce you to our presenter today, uh, Jamie Shine, who has, we're welcome to hear you today. Um, Jamie has 15 years of combined internal and external audit experience. She is the corporate and IT manager for Quick Trip Corporation, where she manages operational, IT, and financial audits and consulting engagements. And Jamie enjoys being a volunteer facilitator for the IA. She teaches not only the IACI learning system, but also many other online and in-person trainings as also being as she is a reoccurring speaker at many other IA conferences. Jamie just rolled off as a four-year term uh, as a district representative and a member of the IA's North American Chapter Relations Committee and was appointed to the Global Institute Relations Committee in 2022. She also has many articles published in the Internal Audit Magazine and loves any chance she has to share her passion and her risk for risk management and internal audit. So with that, I will turn it over to Jamie. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kelly. So I'm excited to be here with all of you today. We're going to be talking about preparing for part three of the CIA exam. I remember when I took the CIA exam many years ago, Part three was the most challenging part for me, and so I'm excited to get to share some tips with all of you today. We're going to be talking about the part three exam syllabus and a little bit about what's included in this exam. And then we're going to get into some tips for how to study and how to take this test the most successfully for you. We're gonna do a few practice questions, and then we're going to give you some opportunities to ask questions that you may have about the exam. In our questions, we're going to be focusing more on the training materials and the exam itself as opposed to digging too deep into the content, but we can certainly point you in the right direction for content questions. And then that will be our wrap up today. And we're going to move to the next slide, please. Or do I have control of the slides? I think I do. There we go. Don't Sorry, worry. guys. So in our part three exam syllabus, kicking this off, we're going to have a large portion, 35% on business acumen or business knowledge, and then also a fairly significant part, 25% on information security, 20% on information technology or IT, and 20% financial management. This is actually a little bit different than when I took the exam, and there was a lot less on information security and information technology. This part of the exam is 120 minutes and 100 questions. So a good tip that I like to give is try to pace yourself and make sure that you're going through about one question per minute. If you're getting far behind that, then I recommend that you start going through the questions more quickly and then flag any of the questions that you're not certain about so that you can come back to them. But what a lot of people struggle with in taking the exam is running out of time. So again, you have 100 questions, 120 minutes. So try to answer about one question per minute. In our part three syllabus, the number of topics has been greatly refocused to the core areas that are most critical for internal auditors. When I sat for the exam probably 12 or 13 years ago, not all auditors were expected to be IT auditors or information security auditors. Whereas now, even though we definitely still have those auditors who are experts in that area, that's what they focus in, every auditor needs to have a basic understanding of core information security and information technology or IT principles. We don't have any auditors anymore who just focus on manual processes or very few. I haven't met any of them. And so something that I really appreciate about the exam is that as you're studying for it, it really is preparing you to be a successful internal auditor. The exam is really partially launching you. It's training you. It's preparing you. And so you do have 
that credential behind your name, but it's not just the credential behind your name. It's not just about the certification. It's also about what you learned during the studying. And so I think it's great that it has refocused on these areas that we do need to know to be successful internal auditors. The exam syllabus features a new subdomain on data analytics, which was also not present when I sat for the exam years ago, because at that time, data analytics weren't necessarily a core piece of what internal auditors did. Whereas today, I don't know any internal audit shops that don't use data analytics. The good news too is that you probably already have some familiarity with these subjects. And the information security part of the exam has been expanded. So it includes additional topics like cybersecurity risk, because cybersecurity risk are now part of every business process that we face. Every business process has cybersecurity risk in it. And so we have to have at least a base level of knowledge about cybersecurity risk, as well as emerging technology practices. Again, it used to be that internal auditors didn't all need to have an understanding of technology practices and risk, but now we do. And then again, our largest domain is business acumen, 35% of the exam, so business knowledge. A portion of the exam requires you to demonstrate a basic comprehension of concepts, but some of the exam questions will require you to demonstrate proficiency in your knowledge, skills, and abilities. And when we talk about demonstrating proficiency, what we mean by that is that you can apply the knowledge conceptually. You can apply it in real world situations or in case studies. So you can't just memorize the content. You have to also be able to apply it and show that you could use it in your work. So moving on to some study and test taking tips, and you're welcome to share any of yours as well in the Q&A. Some are choose your study method. You all are lifelong learners and you've all clearly graduated from a university or a college. You graduated from a high school. So you know what study method works best for you. So don't try to use a one size fits all approach. Think about how do you study the best? For some people that's studying in a group. I know a lot of people that it's hard for them to focus on their own. They need to study in a group. So you may look into seeing if anyone else in your area or even somebody online wants to study together. I know that when I sat for the exam, one of my best friends was going through it at the same time. And so we would study together. We each had our own copy of the CIA learning system and we would meet together usually in the evening and maybe we'd do dinner together and then we would go through the exam questions and that way we could debate about the answers together and we could really get a great understanding together of why the correct answer was the right answer. Also, it's important to be realistic. I've heard people say, I'm going to sit for all three parts of the exam in one week, I'm gonna take them all at once and it's gonna be great. I don't really need to study. That may not be realistic. Even if you have experience as an internal auditor, it's important to make sure that you're going through the content, that you are setting aside time to study and be realistic with what you have going on in your life. It may be that you have time to study for four hours a day, but most of us don't have that time. But for me, setting aside a specific amount of time every day or every week was helpful in making sure that I was staying on track and meeting those objectives. And make sure you're avoiding procrastination. I know I can be guilty of procrastination but that's the worst thing that can happen when you're sitting for this exam because there is so much content to learn. So again, it can be great to set aside a specific amount of time every day that you're going to study or maybe five days a week that you're going to study. And then set your study plan. You can actually go through your syllabus, divide up the content and say, I am going to study these slides. I'm gonna take this practice exam on this day and stick to your study plan. Make sure that you're pacing yourself. Sometimes candidates will wait until right before to study because things keep coming up. We're all busy. You may have family obligations, work obligations, personal obligations. And then when it comes to taking the exam, you haven't gotten to put the time in that you expect it to. We wanna make sure that we show up to study. A great tip is to use flashcards. You can use the flashcards provided for definitions and things on the CIA learning system, or you can make your own flashcards. I like to get a little set of index cards for myself and write key things that I want to remember on these index cards, and that can be really helpful in studying. Also, focus on the proficiency areas. Like we talked about, proficiency means that I don't just need to memorize content. I need to know how to apply this content in real world situations. So it can take longer to study for those areas because you need to think about how you would apply this as a chief audit executive or as an internal auditor 
in either your organization or a different organization. Focus on those areas. You can see in the syllabus as well as in the CIA learning system if a section is going to have proficiency questions in it, and if it will, focus on those areas. And make sure that you can understand the application. When you're reading the concepts, think to yourself, how would I apply this in my job? Maybe even pretend like you're an internal auditor at a different organization and say, how would I apply this for this type of audit? How would I apply this as an IT auditor? How would I apply this as a fraud examiner? How would I apply this as an internal auditor for an oil and gas company or for a banking company? And obviously, I'm not saying that you need to have the technical knowledge of all those different types of internal auditors, but think through real world scenarios where you would apply this knowledge, apply that specific understanding, which means going beyond memorization because you will not pass this exam if all you're doing is memorizing the lectures from the CIA learning system, if you're not thinking critically. Just like we have to think critically as auditors when we're working with our clients, we want to make sure that we're going beyond memorization and thinking critically the entire time that we're studying, focusing on real-world application and proficiency. Also, make sure that you're prepared for the computer-based test format. What's great is that you have access to test that out already at home. So when you get to, maybe you're taking the exam at home or maybe you're taking it at a facility. When you get to that facility, you don't want to be stressed because you have no idea what the computer-based test format is going to look like. Go ahead and do those practice quizzes as an example and practice tests. That's going to help you get ready for that computer-based test format as well. And then consider those real life examples. What would this look like in real life? When I was studying for the CIA exam, it was really beneficial for me because I had just started doing, I was working in public accounting, and I just started doing internal audit outsourcing engagements. And so I was able to directly apply that knowledge to my audit clients. And I was able to think, this is how this works. That audit that I'm doing right now, this concept that I'm learning, I was able to connect the dots and understand how they related together. And that was really helpful to me when I was studying. When it comes to actually taking the exams, there are a lot of tips as well. First of all, sometimes people know the content, but they choose the wrong answer because they're not reading the question all the way through. They see a keyword in the question and they see a similar keyword in the answer and they guess. You are professionals, you are internal auditors, you know the material. At the point at which you take the exam, you will know the material. So make sure that you're being very careful when you read the question. Read it all the way through. Make sure you really understand what the question is asking. One tip is to read that last sentence before all the details. Because sometimes when I'm reading a paragraph of details, I get lost in the details. And then when I read the last sentence or the question, all of a sudden I have to read the details all over again because I've forgotten them at that point. So if you read the question first, then when you're going through the details, you can understand, okay, this is what I need to pick out of the details. Also, look for clues. Words like all, except, not. Sometimes we skip those words. Sometimes our brains rush right past them. If I'm saying all of this, these criteria must be true, that would be different than saying pick one criteria that would be true. That would change my answer. So look for those clues and make sure that you really understand exactly what the question is asking. Also, before you've even read the choices, think of what your answer would be. If I'm reading a question, I should think in my head, what would the answer to that be? And then find a choice that matches the right answer. Sometimes when we start with reading the choices, we get lazy and we pick something that sounds good without really thinking critically. So if you're thinking of your answer first, that's really helpful in helping you think critically first. Also, something that can be a trap for internal auditors, especially internal auditors, I think who have a lot of experience at one organization, is that sometimes we only consider our experience in our industry, and so that narrows our focus. Whereas if we're thinking broadly and globally, think about it from an enterprise standpoint. People from so many countries I don't want to say every country, but so many countries are sitting for the CIA exam and the answer is going to be the same answer for somebody in the United States of America, for someone in Canada, for someone in Bolivia, for someone in South Africa, 
And so make sure that you're bringing a global perspective and thinking about which would be the most true answer for internal auditors around the world. And something that can be a great tip is to go ahead and eliminate the obvious distractors or the obvious wrong answers. What I found, and this is not a general rule, but often if there are four answers, usually two of them are very obviously wrong. Sometimes they're so wrong it's, it's even humorous. So go ahead and eliminate those. I know that answer is wrong. I know that answer is wrong. Most of the time, you can immediately eliminate those two wrong answers and be left with two potential answers to choose from. That increases your percentages of guessing the right answer exponentially, right? And so instead of having to guess between four, at this point, you're guessing from two. And then hopefully you're not guessing at this point and you can use your critical thinking skills and your knowledge to choose the best answer between those two that are left. Also, trust your first impressions and avoid overanalyzing. Some people get really stressed about taking an exam and that's understandable. And so they start to second guess themselves. They start to overanalyze and they start to make an argument for every single answer, even those obvious wrong answers so what some research has found in the past, not specific to the CIA exam, but just in exams in general, is that people tend to pick the correct answer first. Not always, but on average, when people switch their answers, it is more likely that they're switching to an incorrect answer. So trust your first impressions. Avoid overanalyzing. Now, sometimes you will be reviewing your work and you will need to change your answer because you got it wrong the first time. I'm not saying that you shouldn't change your answer. But if you overanalyze, sometimes you get to the point that your brain is tricking you into choosing a wrong answer, even though you know the right answer to begin with. Also, don't skip questions. If you're uncertain, answer it anyway. There are some types of exams where you get points penalized, negative points, if you choose a wrong answer. So it's better not to answer if you don't know. This is not one of those exams it's better to guess. If you have four answers, you have a 25% chance of getting it right, even if you have no idea what the answer should be. So go ahead and put something down, especially if you can eliminate a couple of wrong answers. <coughs> Excuse me. So flag it for review later. later. Something that I appreciate about the CIA exam is that there's an option in the system, and if you've sat for it before, you know this, where you can flag questions for review so that you don't have to review every single question. So if I'm uncertain about anything when I sit for an exam, I flag it, I pick what I think is the best answer, and then I come back to it with the time that I have at the end of the exam. Another benefit of this is that you're less likely to run out of time in the exam because sometimes we find that one question and we just don't know the answer and we may spend five or 10 minutes trying to figure it out. Don't do that unless you know you have plenty of time. Try to answer one question per minute. So if you don't know, select something, move on, flag it for review layer, later, and then if you have time left at the end of the exam, come back and then spend your time on it. Make sure that you're budgeting your time. Don't rush. Again, try to do one question per minute. Now, if you're rushing and you're doing one question every 10 seconds, you're probably not really spending adequate time to read the question, to really consider what does this question mean? Is this the right answer? What's the best answer? Another tip that's not listed here is look for the best answer. Sometimes there may be two answers that could be right in certain circumstances. And in that case, pick the best answer, the answer that would most commonly be right or would always be right. And then make sure that you're well rested and comfortable for the exam. Make sure that you've eaten a good meal before the exam, that you're full, that you have water that you're wearing something that you're comfortable in. Try to get a really good night's sleep the night before. Sometimes people will stay up all night studying for the exam, and generally that's not going to benefit them. It's better to do your prep work in advance and then get a great night's sleep that night. Also, it's important to think beyond your own personal experience and your industry. So consider that you work for a publicly traded company, maybe you work for a private company, but imagine, what would this answer be if I worked for a publicly traded company? Make sure that in your world, the CAE reports to the audit committee of the board. You may work for an organization where that's not the case. For example, at certain nonprofits or government entities, we may not call the governing body the audit committee. But when you're taking this exam, assume that the chief audit executive reports to the audit committee of the board, unless stated otherwise. Assume that you have a large audit department with varying staffing levels. 
And also, it's great if you can get some kind of knowledge in manufacturing, auditing accounts payable, purchasing inventory and receivables. So if you already have that experience, that's great. If not, focus on learning that as you're studying for the exam. We are going to move on to some practice exam questions. And I do see that some questions are coming in. We will be taking questions at the end as opposed to throughout the webinar, but feel free to submit those anytime. And thank you so much for submitting all of your questions. We've got some really good ones coming in. So when it comes to our practice exam questions, we're gonna give everybody a little bit of time to read this question and select what you think the correct answer is. I cannot identify who you are or who selected which answer, so your answer is anonymous, so no pressure to get the correct answer. The question is, which is an appropriate consideration in evaluating a credit department's KPIs? And if you don't know what a KPI stands for, that's a key performance indicator. Thanks, Jamie. So please go ahead and select the radio button next to the response that best represents your answer. And also please make sure to hit the submit button. We are going to monitor the results as they come in over about the next 45 seconds. And I'll give you a notification when we're going to close the poll. Thank you. If you're not seeing the question on the screen, I'm guessing they probably need to refresh. Would that be correct, Kelly? Yes, we would recommend trying to refresh or hit F5 or the refresh on a Mac. Thank you. All right, it appears that most of the results have been submitted. So we will be closing the poll in just 10 seconds and then we will pop up the answer and turn it back over to Jamie. There we go, there's the answers. Wonderful and great job. 64% of you got the correct answer. So if you picked the correct answer, give yourself a big pat on the back. Kudos, wonderful job. And we're gonna talk about the reason that this is the best answer. I wanna go through every question or every answer though and explain why it's not the best answer or the best answer. So first of all, C is the correct answer. Are the credit department measures operating efficiently and effectively? That's the best answer because that is something that we would use in evaluating a credit department's key performance indicators. Are their measures operating effectively and efficiently, right? Are they the right measures? And our key performance indicators, they should map out to strategic objectives. It's important that we don't have too many KPIs or too few KPIs and have both short and long-term financial goals. A is not a great answer because are they exhaustive enough to cover even minor credit area objectives? That might be suggesting 
that we would have too many key performance indicators if we're focusing on even minor credit area objectives. The key word there that I would clue in on is minor. If it's a minor objective, we may not need a key performance indicator for it. And then are the measures in line, number B, or number B, letter B, are the measures in line with short-term financial goals for the credit area? This would also be an incorrect answer because we would want to make sure that the measures are in line with both short-term and long-term financial goals, not just the short-term financial goals. We already discussed why C is the best answer. And then the last question, are credit employees professional in the achievement of objectives? Well, first of all, that may not even be a key performance indicator. Second of all, that wouldn't be something that we would universally consider in select in evaluating the credit department's key performance indicators. It wouldn't be the most important thing for us to consider. And it probably wouldn't even be anything we would be considering because we're focusing on we're focusing on the achievement of objectives and the strategic objectives as well as their area objectives. So that wouldn't be the most important thing in evaluating the key performance indicators. Now that could be a key performance indicator, but if we're evaluating the key performance indicators, we wouldn't be evaluating that specifically. I'm gonna move to the next question. I'll hand it off to Kelly. Okay, so the next question is up, and please uh, go ahead and read the question and then select the radio button next to your response. And again, we'll give you a little bit of time here before we push the answers up. Okay, so 10 more seconds and we'll push up the answer. Make sure to hit your submit button once you select your answer too, please. Wow, fantastic job, everyone. 85% of you got this one correct. The correct answer is C, make recommendations to address the issue. So. Great job, kudos if you got this one correct. And we're going to talk through this one as well. An IT auditor discovers a weakness in IT general controls. What should the auditor do? Answer A is clearly incorrect. We would not communicate the issue to the board first. That would violate our standards. We have to first communicate with management before we go straight to the board for many reasons. First of all, from a relationship standpoint, it would be horrible for us to go to the board before we talk to management. Second of all, we need to validate the issue before we present it to the board. And so validating the issue would require talking to management. So first we communicate to the board. Letter B, resolve the risk exposure created by the deficiency is also clearly wrong because our standards do not allow us to resolve the risk exposure. That would compromise our independence because we would be taking the role of management and actually resolving the risk exposure, probably by implementing a control. Internal auditors can't be the ones to make risk decisions and implement controls. We have to be objective and independent. And so it would be inappropriate for us to resolve the risk exposure. But C is correct because it is our job to make recommendations to address the issue. And then management would be the one to accept 
and choose to implement those recommendations. They would be overseeing the implementation. D is also incorrect because it's not the role of the internal auditor to set the deadline for the implementation of controls. Management is responsible to set a deadline for control implementation. Internal audit is allowed to challenge that deadline. So for example, if we found a risk exposure and management said, we will have a control in place in the next 20 years, we might challenge and say, we, need, we feel that you should implement a control sooner than that. 20 years would allow a lot of risk to occur and that would exceed our risk appetite. But we would not be the ones setting the actual deadline for the implementation of controls. I'm gonna hand it back to Kelly as we move to our next oh. question. Okay, we have our third polling question and um, practice question, one more after this. So the next question states that a new organization decides to use the COVID IT control framework, which is true of this decision. So again, please choose your radio button and hit submit and we'll give you a few minutes, or a few minutes, <laughs> a few seconds. Okay, we've got a couple of seconds here and we're gonna push the answers out. One second, and the answers will pop up, and I'll turn it back over to Jamie to review. There we go. We are all over the board on this one, which I expected. This is a challenging question. So the correct answer is C. 51% of you got that correct. That is a hard question, so great job, those of you who got this correct. And we're going to talk through this one as well. The organization decides to use the COVID IT control framework, which is true of this decision. Looks like 11% of you selected A, which is sort of a trick answer. A says the framework is a best practice and should be used as is. The reason that's a trick answer is that all frameworks need to be modified and tailored to the needs of the organization. They need to be adapted to make sure that they're meeting that individual organization's needs. So that's why A would be incorrect. B says the framework helps keep lines of responsibility less formal. The opposite is actually usually true. Often frameworks will help keep the lines of responsibility more formal and the COVID framework would generally help keep the lines of responsibility more formal, at least in, in many cases. C is correct because it indicates that we need to adapt that framework to suit the needs of the organization. So yes, the framework should always be modified by, to reflect risk appetite and risk tolerance. Risk appetite is the amount of risk an organization is willing to assume in order to pursue value. Some organizations may have a very low risk appetite. That would drive their governance processes as well as their controls. Other organizations may have a higher risk appetite and that would drive their governance and their controls. They may have fewer internal controls in place if they have a high risk appetite because they're willing to take on more risk. And the risk appetite is set by the board of directors or the audit committee. D says the framework includes overall organizational controls in its guidance. D is incorrect. It's a bit of a tricky answer as well because 
COBIT is a specific IT governance framework, IT governance and IT controls. So it's not going to include overall organizational controls that aren't specific to IT. That's why D is incorrect. We have one more practice question for you guys. So I'm gonna hand it over to Kelly. Okay, last question of the day. Uh, which applies more to the income statement than to the finance or the statement of financial position? So again, please select your answer and hit the submit button and we'll give you a few seconds here. We see the answers are coming in, so just a few more seconds and we'll push the answers through for our last question of the day. <laughs> Looks like we are all over the board on this one as well. The question is, which applies more to the income statement than to the statement of financial position? And the correct answer is D, evaluating creditworthiness. So 30% of you got this one correct. Pat yourself on the back, kudos, great job if you got this one correct. This is a challenging question if you don't have experience in financial auditing. And I would really focus on the financial management section of the exam if you don't have any background in financial auditing or public accounting or, or auditing any kind, of, any kind of accounting. So we're gonna go through each answer again. First of all, I wanna clarify because some of you may not have heard of the term statement of financial position. You may also hear that called the balance sheet. That's what it's commonly called in the United States of America. So that may have been why you answered a different response. So we're saying, which applies more to the income statement than to the balance sheet or the statement of financial position? A is wrong because it's evaluating if inventory levels are sufficient. Inventory levels are on the statement of financial position. Inventory levels aren't on the income statement. B is also wrong, evaluating capital structure, because capital structure would be spelled out more on the statement of financial position on our balance sheet. That's where we would see our breakdown of capital structure. And then evaluating liquidity. The metrics that we would use to evaluate liquidity are debt. That would also primarily be on the statement of financial position or the balance sheet. But evaluating credit worthiness would take into account net profits from primary activities. And that would be a key credit worthiness indicator. What are our net profits from our primary activities? So that would be on our income statement. So that's why evaluating credit worthiness would apply more to the income statement than to the balance sheet. Great job, everyone who got that correct. We are now moving into the Q&A section of our presentation. And I believe thank you so much, Kelly Jane. has some questions. Oh, thanks, Kelly. Yeah, absolutely. We have had a lot of great questions coming in. I will try to get through as many as we can here. 
Um, and just to let you know, if we do not have a chance to answer your question today, we will be providing a link to a uh, website where you can download the slides and a copy of the recording. And we will also be posting answers there to any questions in our FAQ section that we may not have been able to answer. If your question is specific to your situation too, we'll reach out to you directly and answer your question. So please feel free to continue to submit any questions you have for our Q&A and we will get through as many as we can. Um, so the first question, Jamie, um, things that a couple questions came in about exam scoring. So could you just reiterate um, how the scoring works on the exam and what score that they need to have to pass? Definitely. So your raw score is calculated based on the number of questions answered correctly, and then it's converted to a reporting scale that ranges from 250 to 750 points. And you need to score a 600 or higher to pass. So uh, unfortunately, I can't tell you you need to get a certain number of questions correct to pass, but you do need to score a 600 or above. Perfect. There's also been a number of questions on the IT section of part three. Uh, people are asking if they don't have a lot of IT experience, do you have any recommendations for them on how to best prepare? Definitely. I think going through the CIA learning system content is going to be the best way to prepare because that really is the best resource that you have, making sure that you're taking the questions and that if you get a question wrong in your practice quizzes, make sure that you understand why it was wrong. That's very helpful. But aside from that, if you feel like you'd like some additional resources, something that I recommend is if you have the access and the resources to do it, you can take some additional courses. One that I recommend if you want a fundamental level of understanding is a four-hour course that the IIA offers called IT General Controls. That's a course that I facilitate. It's a great course that gives you a fundamental understanding of IT audit concepts. There's also a fundamental, and I don't know the name of the course, but there is a fundamental cybersecurity course that the IIA offers. I believe that's a 16 hour course. That's offered online. The IT General Controls course is also offered online. And then another course that might be helpful to you is Fundamentals of IT Audit, which is also an IIA course I believe that's a 16 hour course as well. Perfect, those are a lot of great um, suggestions. Thanks, Jamie. Um, okay, another question came in that uh, they heard that, that there are new questions that were added to the CI learning system. How do they access those new questions? That's a great question. Yes, 400 new questions were added this year. And there's now over 2,600 practice questions in the version 7 learning system. If you have access to the current version 7 materials in a valid online license, you'll see the new questions the next time you log in. So you don't need to purchase an upgrade. And if you don't have the current version, if you have version 6 but you'd like to upgrade to the new version 7, you can apply for an upgrade at learncia.com backslash upgrade. And I believe that you'll have access to that in the FAQ as well. So that's something that you can Google if you didn't jot down the link to that. Also, somebody did mention a great point that I wanted to bring up about the GTAGs, how that can be a great resource for you as well. The GTAGs are in the supplemental guidance section of the IIA's website. They're part of the standards and they are very helpful. GTAGs are a resource that the IIA provides for free to members and they're on topics like cybersecurity, like logical access, like change management, so IT audit topics. And they're free, which is great. Something that I love about the GTAGs as well, aside from them being a great free resource for members, is that they're written for non-technical auditors. They're written so that a chief audit executive who's not a technical IT auditor could read them and understand. <coughs> so whoever suggested that, that's a wonderful tip. Perfect. Um, we also have heard from many candidates that they are really enjoying the ability to test from home. The question is, is will I be able to continue to test from home throughout this year? Yes, the option to test from home is still available in most locations, but you can check the IA certification website to get more specific information on whether it's an option in your location. Perfect, thank you. 
And a few people also commented that they just missed the exam just um, by a couple points or they've just struggled to pass the parts and are recommending if they should have taken an instructor-led course, would that help them pass? <laughs> what are your thoughts on that, Jamie? That's a great question. I feel like it really depends on each person's study preferences and how they learn the best. For a lot of people, the instructor-led courses are very helpful because, first of all, they give you structure. You're setting aside that specific amount of time to study, and you get a lot of exam tips. You have that accountability. Another great benefit of that is that you can ask questions. And so, for example, if you're doing a practice test and you don't understand why that answer is the correct answer, you can ask the instructor and you can get that one-on-one -on -one interaction from the instructor. So I do think that it can be a great option, particularly if you're that close to passing. I don't think it's necessary to take the instructor-led course to pass the exam. Certainly people pass the exam just by using the CIA learning system material but it might be a great option for you. And there are a lot of courses available online and in person. I know I personally learn the best from in-person courses when possible for me. Of course, that's not always possible. Some people actually learn better online, but you can go to learncia.com to see what courses are available for you. Perfect. Okay, somebody else asked that, um, let us know that they previously purchased the IACA learning system that their online access expired, is there a way to extend that? Yes, you can apply for an extension at learncia.com slash extension, and there is a small charge to extend. Perfect, thank you. Another person said that they had previously purchased the learning system version six, but they would like to upgrade to the new version seven to be able to have access to those new practice questions. How would they upgrade to the new version seven? Definitely, I would recommend upgrading to version seven. You can apply for your upgrade at learncia.com slash upgrade. And it's actually a free upgrade for you if you have the current version six and you purchased it after a certain date. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, this is a language question. Um, this person had asked, they registered for the exam and plan to take the exam in French, but they would like to know if they could also see the questions in English while they're taking the exam in French? That's a great question. Yes, you actually can toggle between languages, which is wonderful for people who are multilingual. Perfect. Um, and in terms of recommendation for study time for part three, is there an amount of specific amount of time that you recommend that they spend studying for this specific part? It really depends on your background, your experience level, your education. If you're brand new to internal audit and all of this is new to you, I would definitely recommend spending more time on it. Or if you have no background in IT audit or in financial auditing, as an example, I'd also probably spend more time. We recommend a minimum of 40 hours for part three, but you may need more hours than that. And so it's really going to be up to you. Something that I heard as a tip that I tell everyone, I think it's a great tip, is read the CIA Learning System study materials cover to cover three times. And when I say read them, sometimes when I say I read something, I skimmed it or I scanned it and I didn't really read it and think through it. So actually read it, focus on it, interact with it a minimum of three times. I also believe that you should take all of the practice quizzes and all of the practice tests. That's me personally, though. I know when I sit for an exam, I like to feel very comfortable going into it. And so the more that I've studied, the more comfortable I feel. Perfect. Uh, okay, next question is about, it's actually a follow-up to the instructor-led course recommendation that we just talked about. Um, this person is interested in taking an instructor-led class, but there isn't a live class that's offered in their area. And they're just wondering if there might be any other options. Definitely. And there's a lot of online classes available. And so you can take a live online class where you're getting to interact real time with the other course participants and with the instructor. You also can, most of these are also recorded. So if there's time zone differences or conflicting plans and you can't commit to a live course, you may be able to listen to the recording as well. And you can find that list of online courses at learncia.com. Okay, and the next question is a uh, candidate has mentioned that they are 
a uh, CPA and they had heard about the challenge exam, or this also applies to chartered accountants as well. Um, is there going to be a challenge exam offered this year? Yes, there is. The first challenge exam registration window just closed, but there's going to be another one available in September, so this month, I think. That's right. That is right. Yep, it's open currently that's this month. That's correct. <laughs> okay, perfect. So never mind what I said about the window just closing. I was I was backdated. Yes, uh, we did have previous challenge exam window. The new window is already open, so you can go ahead and register for the challenge exam. And you can check the IA website for additional information about qualifications. The challenge exam is a fantastic benefit if you qualify for it, if you're a chartered accountant or a CPA, because instead of sitting for three parts of an exam, you're only having to sit for one exam. So it's a fantastic way to earn your CIA certification very quickly. Perfect. Thank you, Jamie. Um, okay, let's see. This next question is about um, the length of online access. If somebody purchases the IACA learning system, how long are they able to access the software? Great question. So if you purchase the full kit, which is parts one through three, you have access for two years. And like we mentioned earlier, you do have the option to extend your access for a small fee. And if you purchase a single part of the exam, for example, if you were to purchase just part three, you have that access for one year. Perfect, great. Um, the next question, lots of good questions coming in here. Are there any discounts available for groups for somebody to purchase the learning system? If somebody wants to buy for their team or with their coworker? Yes, there's a 20% off discount for groups of five or more. And so even if you have a group of people, maybe all in your IIA chapter and you all need to purchase the CIA learning system, you could get a group of five or more and get that discount. And you don't even need to all purchase at the exact same time. If you want more information on this group discount, you can contact Mike Downs. And the contact information is Mike, M-I-K-E dot Downs, D-O-W-N-S, at the IIA.org. Great, thanks. And we're going to share his email address in an upcoming slide, too. So if you didn't have a chance to write that down, we'll share it in a minute. Um, so I want to go through two more questions, because I know Jamie has some information to share about a special discount, and I want to make sure everybody has time to um, access that information. So let's um, take this question. Do the exam uh, parts need to be taken in sequential order? No, the good news is you can take them in any order. So if you want to take part three first and then parts one and two, you're welcome to do that. Okay. And then um, do they need to be a member of the IA to take the exam? No, they do not need to be a member of the IA to take the exam. But I really recommend becoming a member because of all of the savings. And I feel like it really evens out. I love my IA membership for a lot of reasons. It has been invaluable in my career. I really can't imagine my IA or my internal audit career without my IA membership because of the resources I've been given access to, because of the trainings and because of the discounts. So the discounts for me have more than made up for the cost of my membership. You save on exam application fees, registration fees, the learning system, so the training materials, and then you also get other member benefits. Also, once you pass your exam, one of the huge benefits for me of my IA membership is that I'm not paying to report my CPE every year. And that can be a fairly substantial piece. There's a lot of benefits of your IIA membership, but no, you do not have to be an IIA member to take the exam. Perfect. Thanks, Thanks Jamie. Okay, so um, I want to make sure you have time to um, get through the rest of your slides. So if we did not get to your question uh, today, we apologize, but we will post the answers in the FAQ section on the website we're going to share in a minute here. I appreciate you submitting those, and I'm going to turn it back over to Jamie to wrap up. Thanks, Kelly, and thank you all for submitting your great questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but like Kelly said, you'll have access to the slides and also access to the FAQ website. So we have fantastic news for all of you. As a webinar attendee, you can save 20% on individual parts of the exam. That means that you're paying, if you're an IIA member, only $236 instead of $295, or for the full kit as an IIA member, 
you can get that entire full kit for $636. If you're a person who really likes to use paper, I know some people want to have a physical book. You can also get that printed book as an optional add-on. And that can be really great for some people as well, particularly if you're traveling. I know I've studied for a lot of my exams in the car on road trips. So my spouse was driving, I was studying, and having that printed material was very helpful to me, but you may or may not need that. The offer expires at the end of the month, September 30th, and you can order it online from learncia.com and use the discount code PART3. And again, you will have access to the recording and to the slides, and so you can find that discount code on the slides. And if you want to replay this webinar or you want to review the frequently asked questions, you can go to the address on your screen, www.learncia.com slash CIA webinar part three. Really appreciate all of you coming today and appreciate your passion and your enthusiasm for obtaining the certification for demonstrating your proficiency as an internal auditor. Thank you so much for having us today and for being here with us. And I hope you have a fantastic rest of your day. Great, thank you so much, Jamie. And uh, just to let you know, we will be also sending a follow-up email to all the participants today with a link to that website. So you may download the slides and access the recording. And we'll also just send her an email with the reminder and the discount code available until the end of the month. Thank you very much for attending today. We hope you have a wonderful afternoon or evening and uh, have a good day. Thank you.